things is just sort of this stamp on it or, or anything that belongs to you. What about that? Anything that, but maybe it doesn't belong to him. His, 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 or anything that is his. The Bible doesn't, you know, say stuff is his. Have you read the 10th commandment? So it's, it's obvious how the 10th commandment backs up the eighth. But what's happening here? Um, you know, you, you don't want, so you don't have want, you don't know want to the degree that your needs have been met. And even in this cursed world, the Christian can say, I've been given more than enough, and I've been given better than I deserve, right? And so what need do I have of other property? Now, that is not to make light. We talked about future directive, and of course, there's poverty, and of course, there's charity, and we've talked about all that. That is not to make light of that, but it is simply to acknowledge what Jesus says in Matthew 6, or what we're to pray for in our daily bread, that God does give you what you need. He has ordained these things. Even where there is poverty, he is ordaining the occasion for charity. So in all those things, we just have to put that in that context. And then finally, number nine, sin covets the definition of the facts in a particular case. I don't like what you're calling the facts, which comes to mean I, I don't like what are the facts. Um, so it attacks the ninth. And, and we saw that it was out of Ahab's lust for Naboth's vineyard that Jezebel set her false witnesses in motion in 1 Kings 21. I want that, and if I can get you in jail without killing you, I'm cool with that. But of course, they were the king and queen, so they could just do both. But see, that's what's happening here. And in all of these things, the Tenth Commandment is uh, it's giving us, in a sense, a psychology of all of our disobedience. And so we can get a better sense of the words of Jesus in Matthew 15, 19, where he says, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Out of disordered desire, in other words. Out of the delusion of walking out of his will comes all the sins that you see. You see all that on the surface because of what the green lady said. The fruit with no taste. The, the walking out of his will. In other words, it's a delusion. It's not real. You can't ask for a happiness outside of God. There's no such thing. And out of that delusion comes all the sins that you see in the external world. So let's look at these three uses of the law that we've looked at throughout. First, the civil use of the law. And you might, you know, Again, we talked about this with some aspect of lying and, and other things, you know. Do I want the thought? Oh, here we go again with the thought police. I don't want the state looking at coveting, but, but sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes the civil law is just reading our mail for how we think about the civil. So here's a couple things not to covet. Coveting a different country or different regime or different outcome of the last election or an unrealistic end to the next. All of this can lead immediately to irresponsible behavior in relation to the public square. If you covet things in the civil sphere that are simply not real, it will lead you to be immoral in the civil sphere, and in countless ways, but here's one. One historian of the American founding era a guy's name's David McCulley, wrote a book called 1776, and, and he was writing about the dire moments in that year in facing the British army. And he was reflecting on the defining qualities of great leaders. And he said that, quote, in truth, the situation was worse than they realized. And no one perceived this as clearly as Washington. Seeing things as they were and not as he would wish them to be was one of his salient strengths. To see things as they are, not as we wish that they were or could be. But that one's future, the could be, could be. But are you okay if... God says they won't be. See, so whether it's past, present, or future, we can covet what 
we wish were. What is the source of cowardly indecision? What is He's talking about leadership qualities here. Washington could do what he was doing because he saw things as they were. He didn't waste a millisecond saying, ah. What's the source of our cowardly indecision? Is it not coveting? We long for a time which is not. And we don't do that as ones who are waiting on the Lord's times and seasons. That's the right way to do it. But we do it as ones with an inordinate desire, a desire for that fixed land of Paralandra, which can lead to zealotry, where you violently grasp at change. I'm going to shake things up. It could also lead to its opposite, retreat and denial and numbing your moral sense in a vat of sports or entertainment of some kind or another. But don't fool yourself just because you're not the zealot or just because you're not the couch potato or whatever it is. You could, on both of those extremes, be a coward. And that is born out of covetousness because you don't want the reality that God is ordering right in front of your moral action. That's the civil use, the directive use of the law in every area of life for the Christian. Coveting is not a victimless crime. Clearly, we cannot effectively love our spouses or nurture our children if we are consumed with thoughts of what might have been, right? Oh, it's just nostalgia, yeah, for two seconds, until, you, until it cripples you let alone what we wish were the case now. Even at work, we can see this. We can see that we will be most ineffective in some task to the degree that we spend our energies coveting another job. One of the best ways to be ineffective doing something is to wish you were doing something else to an unhealthy extent. It's natural for a second. Get over it. Because God has placed you in this particular task and so forth. Our sinful natures are a bottomless sea of sin. And coveting is that anchor cast off to another shore that is not real, but what, which will sink us down and sweep us off the deck where God has called us to steer the ship of our loved ones and our own souls off to that eternal shore. This is the meaning of the proverb that says in Proverbs 4.25, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Or from that psalm we heard just two weeks ago, Psalm 131. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Those things too great for me are not just like intellectual puzzles. It is that too. But it's also things that I'm, I'm going to fix everything. Really? You're going to fix everything? So, so that's included in those things too high or too great for me. And then finally, the evangelical use. The, the catechism answer here uses the words, not even the least inclination or thought. And of course, talking about nostalgia, for example, the least inclination that... Yeah, the standard's perfection again. The standard is perfection, which God calls us to. This is why the 10th commandment lends itself so well to the probing evangelical use of the law, our need for a savior, for someone who is perfect in our place because we're definitely not. This is designed to search down into the heart of inordinate desires. Obedience to the 10th commandment says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism says it very well in question 148 about what's forbidden. It uses the phrase uh, discontentment with our own estate. And hopefully that's been clear throughout our, our own estate. But, but see, by estate, we, we don't just mean our physical property. It means our whole lot from God's hand. Our looks, our height, our weight, 
So I can't do anything about So there's this matrix of things that you can do things about, others which you can't and ought not, others which you can but not idolatrously so. So, it, so it, there's that past, present, and future contentment here. But my estate is everything that God is putting before me. Paul's secret to contentment in Philippians 4 is something that every Christian is to learn. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. What makes us see that our hearts are not like this is the law. Paul says in Romans 7, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. You know what he's doing? Thank God for the 10th commandment is what he's saying. Because if it wasn't for the 10th commandment, I would say to myself, I haven't murdered anyone today. I haven't robbed a bank. That 10th commandment is saying, no, 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 you don't understand. If you are not perfectly content with what God's lot is in all things, you think you're God. And Paul is saying, whoa, I did not know it ran that deep. He's saying, he's not saying the law made you covet. That's not what he's saying here. Uh, but that the light of the law produced, or in other words, it illuminated that grumbling heart that was already lashing out blindly in the dark. Now Paul knows that that's how ugly Paul's heart is. And that's what that law is meant to do for us tonight. Who will rescue us from this body of dead desires? So the answer is not well, I'll turn the heat down on desire. Desires are bad. No, that we don't desire enough. We're aiming too low. Christ desired the everlasting kingdom for us. And that's very far from our eyes. But there was once another time when God's people were about to be judged. Things were about to end in the life that they knew. I mentioned that verse from Jeremiah earlier. Well, in the end, later on in Jeremiah when the bloodthirsty Babylonian armies at the gate were about to do their worst. It was very grim. God told his prophet to do a very strange thing. And everybody else is just heading for their bomb shelters. And it's not going to work, and we know how the story ends. But he tells Jeremiah to buy a field. You know, buy, buy this person's property. A worthless little piece of real estate that's about to be conquered and overrun by Babylonians, but it was a sign that God's people would be back. And he had him get witnesses to see that. But what's the real backing of the fact that God's people would be on that land again? It wasn't Jeremiah's money. He says in chapter 32, verse 37, Behold, I will gather them from all the countries, to which I drove them in my anger. I'll bring my people Israel back. And my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. And I will make them dwell in safety. He's talking about the church. Not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. And they shall be my people. And I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way. That they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice, this is God. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness, with all my heart and with all my soul. This is God using language about divine desires, omnipotent joy in making his people happy forever. You hear the language there? Christian, no one has ever desired your highest happiness more than God, and he's promised to fulfill it. He has purchased 
that everlasting plot of land, which Romans 4.13 says is the whole world, and he hasn't purchased it with some earthly deed and a couple of human witnesses, but with his son's own blood. And so he can say to forgiven, covetous ones like us, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 32. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness and your determination to make your people as happy as any people have ever been. We pray that you would forgive us for calling happiness what is not, for envying others, for using others, for not pointing people to you with our highest satisfaction being in you. Forgive us for that now and remind us of your son, that it was his very food to do your will and that he did do it and finished the work. We thank you for this and we pray that you would write this law upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.